Welcome to the Atlanta Football Party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere else, but right here at Locked On, I am your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis, Brent Rollins, and Clint Shamblin. And it's absolutely a party because, hey, we're a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and we get to talk about a winning Bulldogs team. So it is time to get this party started. And you know how it goes, guys. We talk about Georgia. They're smoking people left and right, right? Not. But <laughs> last weekend, they did their thing. And I love the fact that they did it against then number 20 Kentucky, right? The team that was supposed to be so physical and the team that was really going to push them and possibly give them their first L of the season. 51 to 13 was the final. And we know that went in the dog's way. They really imposed their will pretty much in every facet of the game. So Clint, I want to start with you. What did you learn about Georgia's offense in the win against Kentucky? I learned a ton of stuff and I'm going to start with this and I, I will accept apologies from every single person that doubted Mike Bobo. I will. I will accept them. I am gracious. I will forgive you. Mike Bobo was cooking in his bag early and often. If you watch his play selection, what he's able to do, he brought a couple of retro plays out. There's been a number of folk out there who's seen what he did before that were on point. He's expanded the offense. He is spreading the ball out. They are not just forcing it to Brock Bowers, although Brock Bowers is, again, the best college football player in the nation right now but Mike Bobo was in his bag early and often cooking we have the best offense in the SEC no no shade LSU I get it Daniels is exceptional I, I understand yeah. but as a full offense yeah. Georgia is it we are metrically statistically above anybody and everybody and now all of a sudden Georgia fans it's kind of at an identity crisis because you all of a sudden want to say we can go toe to toe with the best teams in the land and you want to shoot out. Let's roll. We got Carson Beck back here. We got Mike Bobo and a slew of options. That's a weird position for Georgia to be in. Now I anticipate the defense to come, come along very, very soon. But what I learned is this offense can literally, I, I will take us against any defense in America right now. And I love our chances to get 35, if not 40 points on the board. And I learned that again, like you said, a very good Kentucky defense. Don't, don't let this game fool you. They are physical. They are good. They are well coached in the trenches, but man, that offensive line and offensive uh, position players absolutely shoved whatever they wanted uh, all the way down the field and, and move guys along. So I, I learned that we can go toe to toe with anybody. Yeah, and I think that was the joy of watching Clint, the fact that it wasn't vanilla, the fact that all of the weapons utilized everything you wanted to see, you really got to see the pass protection, the run protection. I mean, you name yes. it, you really got to see it on offense. So yeah, I think it was a good display. And like you said, I never thought this time, you know how sometimes Kirby Smart's blowing smoke like, yeah, uh -huh. that UAB team has a solid whatever, man. But <laughs> Kentucky, that was the truth. I mean, you know, Ray was. Davis was, yeah, like they truly did have a viable offense, especially a run game. And I know we'll get to defense in a second, but they really were a team that came to the table with some good pieces. And yet Georgia showed out the best they have this entire season. And Clint, I love that you said identity because you guys know we're going to come back to identity in a few yes, minutes. But Brent on. Jarvis, if you guys want to chime in on what you learned on offense this past weekend in an absolute dragging of Kentucky. Identity, I think, is the key word just because they it's it was a back and forth like early in the season. It's a balance between, hey, we've been this efficient monster the past few seasons, what we had with Darnell Washington, what it did for the offense in terms of the mismatches that it created. Now the identity, I think, is truly revealed. They're a passing football team. Like, mm -hmm. yes, they're, they're yes. driven by the ball yes. being thrown. And I, I think all along, I thought that was where it was going to be just because that's where their best players are. Yeah, ours is the best player, Thomas. Love it, M Lad. When he gets mm. fully healthy, Rosemary Jackson. Like all those guys, those the weapons. Like Aaron Smith. Once he finally actually starts playing well, like you add that to it, like that's their best players. And I think that you know we're going to talk a little bit later about what Kirby Smart thinks about that. It's okay <laughs> because if that's my best players and I'm getting the ball in the best players' hands, all right, that's the identity of the team. We go through that pass first. That is what this team is going to be all about. And yeah, and I love the fact that when you talk about the offense and it's interesting because it's the pass sets up the run, right? And you know that because not only do you have receivers who are really amazing at what they do or tight ends who are amazing at what they do, you do have pass catchers who can catch out of the backfield. So I think, you know, you have some really 
you, you, you're you able to just expand your offense kind of any way you, you want to go. So, yeah, Jarvis, I think that when we talk about the whole, just seeing the whole picture, seeing everything just kind of come together for, for this offense, we finally, we saw shades of it in each game, but this might be the game where we can call it complete. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because this is the most they've thrown the ball in the Kirby Smart era, and this is the most they've thrown at Georgia since Eric Zire. How about that? I know you heard Ooh, that name. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's how long so, it's been. Man, yeah, Charles, so, in the Wayback Machine. I love it. Yes. No, man. You know, I throw him out there. So, and I, and I think that, you know, actually just watching this game, it just made me feel like just watching this receiver core, like Brent laid out, this is probably the best receiving core as a group that we've seen. Now, now granted, Georgia has had some amazing, talented wide receivers come through, guys like A.J. Green and all that stuff, just a, just a litany of guys that have come through this through, through, through the hedges. So, But I think that if you're talking about a collective group, mm -hmm. you're talking about Roseman Jack Saint, you're talking about Brock Bowers, you're talking mm -hmm. about Lad McConkey, you're talking about Dominic Lovett, and you're talking about Ra Ra Thomas. Now, two of those guys that transferred in, they were the leading receivers for the team that they transferred from. So when you're talking about putting all these guys in a collective group and saying, you know what? Yeah, we might not have Stetson Bennett, but you think about that talent level, you're talking about an NFL-type roster. Not saying that they this is an a NFL wide receiver core, but I'm saying you're talking about being able to have a quarterback that can distribute the football to these guys who have this type of talent. And, and, and go through the season saying, you know, you're passing the ball at a 53% clip. You know, you're passing more than you run it. And I think that that's going to be something that, you know, we're going to have to pay attention to because, you know, my, we said coming to this season, Mike Bobo likes to throw the football. Yes. And I think that Kirby trusts him enough to say, you know what, I'm going to let you take advantage of the talent that we have right here, this group, while our running game gets its life together, which I know it will, because at some point they're going to have to lean on it to, to win, mm -hmm. some, win some games later on in the year. And I feel, I feel like that Florida game is going to be that game. So I think right now, yes. Oh, you won't, by the way, Jarvis, you won't yeah. say it. I'll say it. Virus okay. is, a, is a top 10 pick. Laz a top two round, two, three round pick. Yeah. Jack Sane, I think, is a fourth round Muhammad Sanu clone. Uh, like Thomas, it, love it. Like all, those guys are going to get drafted. Like it's yeah. all, in, it's an all NFL receiving court. Yeah, I, I was just going to button that. Say, yeah, Jarvis, go, go ahead and yeah. just talk and talk, <laughs> man. This wide receiver group <laughs> is, it is like you forgive me, we come for guys. No, <laughs> no, I they are that group. <laughs> they are. You want to talk about? I know George Pickens is otherworldly, but Rosemary Jack Saint is similar to him in this offense. You want to talk about Ad Mitchell? A one five removed, and another five came in because Ra Ra looks to me to be replacing that very and Lad McConkey. Yeah, go ahead. Ask any NFL GM if you want an insane route runner who gets open no matter where he is on the field and can catch the ball with reliable hands, that's Lad. And then, yeah, Brock Bowers. I, I've, I've been saying this for – if you don't need a quarterback on your NFL roster, I don't care who else you need. I don't care what other – Brock Bowers is your answer in top four. If you don't need a quarterback – Brock Bowers is the answer. This is it receiving core wise. I'm with you. Best yeah. receiving top to bottom we've had at Georgia ever. I'm I'm 100 with you. Yeah, and this is really and I like to just expand it to pass catcher only because Dejon Edwards had he was fourth in catches on Saturday, and the fact that you had an opportunity between the quarterbacks, of course, for 12 receivers, 12 pass catchers to touch the ball on Saturday. I think that's really amazing. Now. This is what's going to be interesting because we're giving a lot of love and a lot of applause to the offense and the defense. Everybody's been kind of saying, oh, they're not quite NFL ready. They're not, you know, they're not Carter. They're they're not uh, Jordan Davis. They're not Trayvon Walker. They're, no, they're not those guys. But they were somewhere in the ballpark of those guys Saturday. Right, Brent? Very much. So. Well, I mean, actually, if you actually go back and watch play by play, Georgia's defense didn't play that well. Kentucky actually just like fumbled it themselves, holding penalty, horrible accuracy oh, from Leary, stupid penalty on defense from zero. Like when you, and then when you do that and then Georgia's offense takes and sort of puts the foot on the gas. Now you have the tempo and the pace of the game completely dictated by Georgia's offense. Kentucky's plan is now scrapped. Like, but there were still holes in the defense in terms of what they, what they did and what could have been taken. Like if Spencer Rattler played that game, that's a back and forth tight game because of the accuracy of him compared to Leary. But in terms of learning about the defense, it's one where their best – like when the offense puts its foot on the gas like that, 
it plays to the defense because the defense's best component is the secondary. Yes. And now you make teams – force the teams to throw the ball. You can now – you dial blitz packages, things of like that. You saw Demis Johnson get a couple sacks. Like mm-hmm. That's how they have to play is offense dictate pace of the game because if not – and you allow teams to sort of stay within what they want to do, especially mm-hmm. the teams that are coming up in their schedule moving forward, then you're going to get games like you saw at Auburn. Then you're going to get games like you saw against South Carolina where it's a little bit back and forth and you have to grind it out. Yeah, I would agree. And I think to your point, Brett, to uh, clarify and kind of like modify that or streamline it, when I say that the defense is starting to look like it would definitely be the secondary. So uh, real quick, Jarvis, Clint, you guys want to chime in? Yeah, I just want to add the fact that this is, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but this is one of the reasons why I feel like Kirby is okay with this offense doing what it's doing because this is the most talented aspect of your team, right? You know, it's part of that one or three. And then the type of defense that you can say you make offense one dimensional, that shrinks your playbook quite a bit. And then when you're trying to play catch up, that's when you're going to start releasing the Warren Brinsons and the Michael Williams of the world. So, all of those things start to come together. Like mm-hmm. when, you, when that identity comes, like you have to answer. You have to understand that's what it is. And I know Kirby wants to run the rock, but this is what, who this team is. And I think that the defense going along with this high-powered offense, that's where that's where Georgia is right now. You're exactly right. I, I think both of your points are, are well taken. Uh, Kamari Lasser showed out in this game. He was not only in phase, but he started going ahead and, and locating the ball, which is a huge, huge thing for defensive backs. We know the three safeties that are there that are incredible. The other safety not named Kamari or the other corner not named Kamari Lasseter still, you know, questionable what's going to happen. Okay, great. But JDJ, I learned this. JDJ is best when he is attacking and not reading. Please send that man on more blitzes because when he's attacking, he is a, a heat seeking missile. And I love that. Don't read and react. Took a step back. I still don't know why for JDJ, but that's interesting to me. Uh, the rest of the linebackers have the speed to do it. And yeah, that defensive interior, you're not going to run at Georgia. Again, go go look at it. You can run around, I suppose. And and that's where linebacker play come into it or scraping over the top. Right admittedly you can't run at them and if you're going to try to pass to beat oh my goodness good luck to y'all just just tease and peace to you trying to throw against that defensive back group because they're going to they're going to get wins more often than losses what i learned is just like the offense early on in the season was questionable and we saw the crescendo right now in this game i think the defense come late november is going to have a crescendo moment the same way. I think guys like Christian Miller, interior defensive line, are going to get pressure, are going to continue to grow and grow and grow. I think they can ascend. They're not there yet, which is very interesting. Um, but I think it's going to be late season. They're going to come on in, in entire force for this SEC run. All right. So we're going to go between the hedges in just a minute. But first, Jarvis wants to tell you guys about a way you can take control of your health. Folks, listen up. Jarvis Save is here for Jace Case Medical. How about this, right? Jace Medical, JaceMedical.com. 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 That is the website that you need to go to. Why do I need to go to Jace Case, Jarvis? How about this? Because Jace Case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. I'm a parent. I have kids. I have, I have two daughters. And guess what? They get sick. And you know what? You won't never want to be stuck unprepared, caught unprepared because especially when you, you don't you have some situations where you're going to need some antibiotics and, and you got got a, a place to go to because Jace Casey has, has all that for you. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. Jace handles everything from online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. So here's what I want you to do, guys. I want to make sure that you go to jacecasemedical.com. That's Jace Case medical.com and use the promo code locked on that's the promo code locked on and you're going to get 20 dollars off i'm telling you guys that's all you have to do so yes go to jacemedical.com pop in the promo code uh locked on for 20 dollars off don't get caught on prepared people So, guys, I want to go back to the identity of the team or, you know, we do this week to week and you guys have stayed steady for the most part, but had just a little bit of a change. Now that we've had this kind of game, I'm interested in kind of seeing what you guys talk about with as it relates to the identity, because that's going to kind of inform the next question I want to ask you. So that said, Clint, what would you say is that one word that you would use to identify or what the identity is of this team? Dominant. 
I mean, I, I just this game showed me again. Kirby Smart ag- against SEC top 25 teams at home. The dude don't miss against the spread games winning on the field. He doesn't miss. It was evident that Carson Beck is him it, again. I, I don't know why. I don't know why we mistrusted everybody, but King Kirby knows what he's doing. We are dominant. If you I look across all of college football landscape, and I know this weekend we're going to learn a lot, Oregon, Washington, that's going to be a game. We are going to know some things. Depending on how that outcome goes, I am now not scared of anybody in college football. Michigan, wh- whatever. I, I just don't care. That defense can't keep up in the offense. I think it's fraudulent. I think we pair up nice <laughs> against anybody in the land. The SEC run from here on out. Florida is going to be an interesting game because it is every single year. Uh, again, with that defense, I think they got some pieces on defense. But for me, it's dominant. And and in the biggest of stages against the biggest of opponents, against all the hype, backs against the wall, Carson Beck isn't him, Mike Bobo this, no running game, injuries across the board. Well, guess what? We're getting healthy, and defense is going to start coming along more. We Again, we're, we're talking 13 points per game. Like, it's somehow we're giving up 25, 30. Like, it's 13 <laughs> points per game, okay, in the SEC. Like, okay. The offense is now then the offensive line. Oh my goodness, that's horseshoe pass protection that you guys have that you guys saw this last game was on point again. I'm just gonna say it, it's dominant. This identity of this team is dominant. And when we when we are in phase, when we're doing the things that we know how to do well, good on good, we will take anybody's best. And we could take anybody's best punch and deliver our punch back. And no one is at the level that Georgia is right now. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, Dominant is the team that that is the name that that comes to uh, mind when I think identity. How about you, Brent? I mean, timing is kind of interesting for is maybe the word that I think of because the timing of the schedule, the timing of just the fact that you've played two straight seasons with 15 games, like there's, there's Mm -hmm. an element to, the grind that is football and Mm -hmm. there's an element to the, the little details of of all of that, that sort of lets you build up to what you want to eventually become when you need it. And you saw that, I think, you know, things back, back of my knowledge in terms of how they restructure their practice leading up to Kentucky, because you want to be sort of at your peak uh, against these better teams. Now the timing of the schedule, that's really the big thing. Vanderbilt this week, yeah, bye week, and then sort of the stretch run where it's a four, you know four or five game stretch of legit like competition each week. I, that's the timing of this year to me has just been very very good. Yeah, that that's a great point, and I think if Clint's point is correct about the defense really hitting its stride and kind of getting a crescendo in November, then Brent's point is absolutely no no uh, pun intended, but on point because. Just as you're ascending, your schedule is complementary of that mm-hmm. ascent. So, yeah, I love that. Uh, Jarvis, what about you? Self-aware. Uh, I think that, you know, recognizing, like, the type of talent that you have on this roster, you know, and I think that Mike Bobo, being an analyst last year, kind of sitting back and kind of assessing the situation, he knew more than likely because, you know, coaches talk, assistant coaches talk, and we all knew that it was no secret that Todd Monk wanted to get back into the NFL. So, mm-hmm. I'm sure he started this process a lot earlier than what we started um, talking about as far as Carson Beck's development and all that stuff. And, and I think that, you know, like it's going to be, I have another moment. Like Carson Beck brings something different to the table when it comes to Stetson Bennett, right? You know, as far as we're talking about arm talent and making certain throws, Stetson Bennett couldn't make those throws, make some, some of those throws that we've seen from Carson Beck so far this year. And I think that, understanding that from a Mike Bobo standpoint saying, okay, I could trust you to, to, to be able to go throw the rock more. I can trust you, you know, to be able to make certain throws that I need you to make with this NFL level type talent that you have at wide receiver yeah. that we have at wide receiver. So I think that self-awareness is one that I say, Hey, you took time out to assess what you have. And then you coming up with game plans week by week. You what three consecutive games with 300 yards or more uh, throwing the rock for Beck and then uh, over 100 yards receiving for, for uh, Brock Bowers in three consecutive games. I don't think that's not a coincidence. <laughs> you know, this is this is planned out stuff. These guys are coming up with game plans and say, hey, here's how we can take advantage of this team. And it's been working week by week by week. Yes. 
Yeah. So we said dominant, self-awareness, timing, and I'm going to say B plus. The reason is, you know, I started the season saying incomplete. So I think we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. And I really like what I'm seeing out of this team. Now, interestingly enough, and this is kind of one that I'm going to pitch out to Jarvis because he asked this question. You guys have said what you think your identity is for this defense. But what about Kirby Smart? Like, what do you think? Mm he's comfortable with as far as what he's seeing identity wise from the offense and maybe what he's seeing identity wise from the defense. I think he's still struggling with it a little bit because here's why, like even when, you know, he was asked about Carson Beck's numbers after the game, you know, and even after the, I believe after the, um, uh, about, I think it was South Carolina. I can't, I can't remember which game it was, but he was asked after the game, he was just saying like, it's like, so, yeah, coach, what about your, you know, Carson Beck, you know, throwing the ball, for blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, we're still, you know, you know, depending on the running game and making sure that, you know, and I was just like, what? What are you talking about, Kirby? <laughs> like, what game are you watching? Like, your passing game is winning you games. You guys are getting off to a great start because you are passing the football from the get-go. You, you're being very aggressive in throwing the football down the field. And I think that, of course, like Georgia has – we talking about these mammoths of dudes, and I'm not a small guy. I'm 6'5", about 340. So for me to call somebody big, like guys like Amarius Mims, who's 6'7", 6'6", and 340, 350, and moving like a bear, a dancing bear, yeah, they got some big dudes. And, yeah, you want to be able to run the football, and those guys come off and mash folks and all that stuff. That's all cool. But, man, mm -hmm. it looks – y'all look real cute throwing the ball. like, And it's okay because y'all have the, the weapons to do it. So – I think that Kirby is struggling with it a little bit because, you know, this this is heart, his heart and soul, you know, he's a defensive minded coach. Yes. He wants to be able to control that clock and everything like that. But, <laughs> man, come on, Kirby. No, it's no, okay, Jervis, man. I promise you. <laughs> no, you're right. Every single – I hate Kentucky week every single year. Normally, this year was – because it's like 16, 13, you know, 19, 13, whatever it is, because Kirby likes getting in a phone booth and just brawling. He <laughs> yeah. loves it. Like, Dude. he is like a pig in mud with that. And if you were telling me that tough – tough defense and trench play and running the ball is going to win. Kirby will take that every single day. Now, all of a sudden he is, it's like, he's kind of a little mad. He's pissed off that all of a sudden he's, he's like fancy and can do tango dancing at the, at, he's like, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, where's, where's my, you could knock somebody with one like, hit. I'm that's what I'm going for. Clint. I don't know about you. If I can knock somebody with one punch, I'm, that's what, that's, that's, that's what I'm going every time. That's right. That's right. No, I'm, you, you nailed it. He, he is having a little, little crisis himself with this because it's not the tip. Typical Kirby smart identity. And all of a sudden you're like, but Kirby, it's okay, man. We're, we're an offensive juggernaut. And he's like, I don't know about that. He's a grumpy old man. And I personally, I like it. I like that in my head coach. I truly do. Keep on doing your thing. Let Mike Bobo cook in the kitchen and don't even go in there. Just be mad on defense, Kirby. Get him right. Right. But Brent, that was what we saw out of Nick Saban. And, you know, he's kind of cut from that similar cloth mm -hmm. until Nick Saban figured out if you want to keep winning championships and you want to keep dominating in the SEC and in the West, you're going to have to start throwing the ball. And then all of a sudden you start getting guys like Bryce Young to be, you know, um, under center for them. So I feel like, well, grumpy old man, you are, but that's kind of consistent with what we've seen, you know, with some of the other coaches before they finally accept that this, that football, not just, you know, college football or the NFL, but football overall, it's just, it's a passing, it's a pass happy game. And that's how you're going to still, you need a running game as a compliment, but it's really the pass is really going to set up the run. Let's just be honest. Yeah, but I, I mean, I will say I, I kind of tend to disagree in terms of his comfortability with this. I actually think he's quite comfortable with this because, in, in two, but with one caveat. So the reason I say he's quite comfortable with this is because the dude is the ultimate competitor. Like, I and I, I know some of, I've no been mind. around him enough and know even with his kid, like and how he handles things with his son and the sports and all all this stuff. Like, no matter what it is that he's doing, he wants to win. Thus, yes. he's going to know and be analytical. Like you hear him talk about like explosive play difference being more predictor of victory than, you know, turnover difference, things like that. Like all those things lead itself to winning. And thus mm -hmm. he's going to be comfortable with whatever leads it to winning. And I think he sort of knows that, knows what this team is, knows what it needs to become. The caveat being as long as this, this attack is complimentary football is yes. still efficient is still consistently getting third downs or getting, you know, first downs and not being three and out. Like if you start throwing, you know, if you start putting the ball in the air and that, by the way, I think that's why you've seen 
Georgia evolved so much in terms of the short passing game. Yeah. And quick screens, yeah. things like that, because it's yeah. it in ups your efficiency, keeps you in the field, keeps your defense yes. off the field. So as long as it's complimentary, I would say he's 100 percent for it. That's a great caveat. You're dead on with that one. He he wants to be balanced, which is why it's 53 percent pass rush and not, you know, 58, 59, something like that, because the run does set up the pass at times, but the pass definitely setting up the run. And as long as he can go ahead, I, again, we call it the death march. As long as he gets a lead in his hands and he wants to keep it, he will lean on Bell and Edwards and now Milton healthy, which by the way, yeah. watch out. Y'all screwed up and you let him get healthy because that dude's that dude is different on this team. Uh, that's a great caveat, Brent. I, I think you're exactly right. Complimentary football is what Kirby wants to do. Whatever whatever way gets a W, that's what he cares most about. He don't care about spreads or anything else. Amarius Mims as well. So he's on his way back. Yes, I'd be interested to see how they handle that with Xavier Trust, Dylan Fairchild, and Michael Morris, you know, being rotating their left guard. So they're gonna have they're gonna have the tools to kind of, you know. Get back to that when they when they need to lean on that. So yeah, yeah. I'm with you. And an embarrassment of riches that nobody Ooh. should apologize for. <laughs> if you want more one on one Atlanta football party combo, Jarvis can tell you how to connect with subtext. Listen up, guys. I'm telling y'all about Locked On Sports Atlanta subtext. I'm telling you, all you got to do is click on the link right there in the description on YouTube, and it's on from whatever audio platform you listen to. It's in the description as well. So all you got to do, if you want to join the subtext, join the conversation. It's an extra conversation. You know, you got a question. Hey, I'm going to be blurting out my random thoughts that I have at 2 o'clock in the morning. You can be right there to read it. So, yeah, go to subtext.com, Locked On Sports Atlanta. I promise you, you won't want to miss out on this. All right, guys. So, I think we all agree that the offense was stellar. We agree that the defense was solid, maybe even above solid, but there's always something or somebody, or we'll say whether it's a coach <laughs> and uh, play calling a player or just the, the team, the uh, unit overall, all of that said, it's next man up time. So I want to know from you guys, Give me first you guys on offense, right? So, Clint, who's your guy on offense where you're like, yeah, I need you to kind of step that up. And it doesn't have to be that they were, you know, that they played poorly because obviously nobody didn't. But maybe if there's just that one uh, level where you want them to put in that, that next gear. Uh, the skill positions are there. Kendall Milton, I'm going to leave a pass because he's coming back from injury. But he, if he continues to ascend like he is, and I've been on record of saying just don't play till you're healthy, it looks like he's there because, again, he's a difference maker. There's there's uh, one position group but two positions and two names. Uh, Dylan Fairchild, Tate Ratledge. If you can do what you did on Saturday consistently, mm. if you can do that on and on and on again, now we are talking about a smoke show that ain't going to be stopped going down the field because you get that interior offensive line pushing guys around like they did and, and the film was amazing on that trust on the right side tackle i don't know why he likes right tackle more than left but he is night and day difference on that right side now it is insane what he's able to do dylan fairchild tate ratledge that that rotation the offensive line specifically in the middle if they can continue to ascend now i have again abject confidence that no one can stop us for, for this week with vanderbilt like the, the biggest key there to me is this is a leadership game mm. so Whoever that step up leader is going to be. And the reason I say that is almost in a totality, not necessarily one individual name, because you should take care of business. Vanderbilt has turned the ball over to no end in every game they've played. Take advantage early, make this a three quarter game, playing the rest of your guys that travel in the fourth quarter. This is a sort of, to me, leadership game. Don't sleepwalk through this game. Yeah. For for me, I kind of kind of just to add to what add on to what Brent was saying. Just this is one of those games where it's saying, "Oh yeah, we got this one." Yeah, <laughs> no, no, yeah, you, not until you, you actually go out there and do it. Like go out there and 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 step on the gas from 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 the jump and, and establish yourself because this is the type of team where a one hit a quarter will suffice. Like you go in here and you say, "Hey, we're Georgia." Um, we're here and not necessarily, you know, not say that, but go out there in the field and prove it and, and slap those guys in the mouth, so to speak. I hate to, you know, choose violence today, but guys, y'all forgive me. It's a, it's a Tuesday, but, you know, I'm trying to figure, figure my life together. But I think this is something where 
This was one of those games where, especially going into a bye week, and mm. then we know what's after the bye week with the Florida Gators. We know how big those those games are each and every year, regardless of record. I really feel like this is one of those games. It's a trap game ish. So make sure this isn't one of those those games where you're saying like, "Oh, Georgia didn't finish those guys until like the mid fourth quarter." Like, what are we talking about here? So yeah, I think this is definitely a leadership game, but make sure this is not a trap game. Make sure mm. this isn't a trap game because mm. yeah. this is something think, that you could easily get into. Yeah, your definition of trap is perfect because, of course, we don't expect them to lose, but Not we don't expect to see them in the fourth quarter, the starters. So, yeah, I think that's where it could be a trap game because, essentially, if you can get out of there in the third quarter, then you're already starting your bye week earlier. So, there it is. that said, <laughs> next up on defense, who do you guys want to see step up on defense this weekend? Man, I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, what'd you say? Uh, the whole defense, no. Oh, the whole defense. front seven. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> no, I would go with Michael Williams. Like, I'm, I'm gonna continue to. Just, I, I was gonna see say this. you've been consistent with Michael. I've been consistent. Williams. Like, I want to see it because this is the type of game that you know become a stat game. Like, you know, those conversations are had. Like, whether people want to believe them or not. Like, hey, man, I'm gonna. Looking at this film, I don't know. I used to have these conversations when I was in college. I was like, hey, man, I'm not a sack getter, but I'm going to try to get one this week because this is what – these are those type of games where you say, hey, you can put some film out there to say get these scouts to start coming to practice a little bit more. So, yeah, Michael Williams, man, I need you, man. I want to see it. I want to see it. I know you got it. I know it's in you. I want to see it, Michael Williams. Warren Brinson, too. Yeah, I got honorable I, mention. Oh, man, Warren, Warren Brinson <laughs> and Michael Williams, those guys get hot going and down the stretch in a full lather. Uh, yeah, it, it's a snowball effect. Uh, I'm going to remain consistent. I've been banging this drum all season, and, man, I need one of the inside linebackers to be an eraser. An eraser on defense is what N'Kobe Dean and Roquan Smith were. When things get sideways, they just erase the play. Uh, bad blocking, bad assignment, somebody misses something, and all of a sudden you got a dude who's so fast, who's so violent, he just says, you know what, I got this on my shoulders. I'm going to take care of it right now we don't have that i think it's gonna be sorry or i think it's gonna be smile mond and i think jdj has found his little niche going in the a gap blitzes but those other two are athletic speedsters enough that they could become erasers they they definitely don't have the play recognition right now or the eyes eyes are failing inside linebackers misdirection and play counter my goodness you want to do a power counter against the inside linebackers and watch them just scramble that's what's happening right now Chaz chambliss is saving their jobs on the other side but i digress uh, I need an inside linebacker to show me he's an eraser, and this is a get-right game for inside linebackers. Dalen Everett. And the reason I say him is because Vanderbilt right now, QBs, lead the SEC in terms of turnover-worthy plays, and I think I uh, interceptions uh, as well. Like, there's going to be balls put in play. They have they have actually have legit you know, receiver talent. Shepard's good as a receiver. And if you think back to two years ago when Georgia played at Vanderbilt, Kamari Lasseter actually had a really good game in a reserve role. A couple pass breakups, maybe even – I can't remember if it was an INT, but it was at least a pass breakup. So, like, Dalen Everett opposite uh, Lasseter this this weekend, I think that's one where – hey, go get, it, go get yourself a pick. All right, guys, that's a wrap. As we said, Georgia's hitting the road this weekend to take on Vanderbilt, and we got our eyes on who's going to be up next. Thanks for stopping by the Atlanta football party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk, and we're also your home for the Braves party on Wednesday. So join us tomorrow to talk all things Braves. See ya.